negative way, but fear the Lord, because I really believe that um, God is on this message, okay? So I'm going to read to you the main scripture of the evening. It's in Romans 8, verse 15. For you have not received a spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Father, we love you. We love you so much. Thank you, Lord, for, for being our Father, for being merciful and for being generous. God, you know the word that you've put on my heart, God, and you know you know how dear it is to me that, that you have given me your spirit, that your spirit inside of me cries, Abba, Father. And so, God, I just ask in Jesus' name that you grace me to share this word that you've given me, that you grace me to release a word that you've planted deep inside my heart, God, and that you let this seed, your word, be planted deep in the hearts of every person who hears you tonight. God, I ask that, that you let every word that is not from you be forgotten and, and that you be on us and in us tonight. God, I thank you. I thank you for the spirit of Elijah. I thank you, Father, that when we sing that these are the days of Elijah, God, that we declare that you are returning the hearts of the fathers to the hearts of the sons and that you are returning the hearts <coughs> of the sons to the hearts of the fathers. And so, God, we just ask that you be that you be with us this evening and that you let your word flow freely and powerfully with no hesitation or distraction. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so um, I'm going to read another scripture to you from Ephesians chapter 6. Another fun little scripture. It's, um, I'm going to start in verse 2 and I'm going to go through verse 4. It says, Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on this earth. And fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Okay, so about three years ago, I was teaching Sunday school, and it's like a high school Sunday school class, and we went through the Ten Commandments because, you know, it's pretty basic to know that the Ten Commandments. So we're going through the Ten Commandments, and when we get to honor your mother and father, I'm praying on my knees before the Lord, and I'm asking him how he expects me <laughs> to teach a scripture that doesn't apply to every one of my class. Now ain't that something? And the Lord so kindly, so gently said to me, I don't think you know what it means to honor your mother and father. <laughs> and the reason I asked the Lord that question is because there was at least one person in our class who I know for a fact, high school person in our Sunday school class, not at this body, at a different body, but whose mother was doing drugs and sleeping around with men. And the reason that this daughter was go or son was going through a very difficult time in high school was because of neglect of her mother and promiscuity of her mother. I said, Father, how can I go in front of this little girl with this life that she has and say, God, your father says, honor your mother and father. Another little girl in our class, or boy, whatever, <laughs> did not have parents at all. How can I say to him that one of the ways that you show God love is to honor your father and mother? How can I teach to a group of believers who do not have awesome parents who I know, I know, hey ladies, hey. come on in, okay. you are welcome, so you are right. loved, you're fine, <laughs> at least you're here, <laughs> at the marriage supper of the lamb, right, some people come at the last minute, yeah. it's not even the last minute yet, this is like halfway, not even halfway, this is like, I'm still on my second scripture, so y'all are so good, okay. Okay? okay, and the scripture is, by the way, honor your mother and father. Ephesians 6 says, this is the first commandment with a promise, 
so that it will go well with you and so that you will live a long and joyful life. Okay, and so when I taught this to my Sunday school class years ago, I was kind of questioning the Lord on it. Obviously, when you argue with the Lord, he wins because he knows, <laughs> he already knows the end from the beginning. Like, he knows what your next argument is going to be, so you might as well just submit to him <laughs> every time. So anyway, there's something, there's something amazing that I noticed about this scripture when the Lord helped me understand it. That it does not say, honor your mother and father as long as they're good Christian people. Yeah. It does not say, um, honor your mother and father unless they beat you. It does not say, honor your mother and father unless they leave you. It says, honor your mother and father so that it will go well with you. So I said, all right, Lord, <laughs> you're going to have to help me because I don't get it. <laughs> How am I going to tell this little girl whose mama's on drugs who's sleeping around, who's bringing in strange men into the home where she has to live, that my God says for her to honor that mother. Yeah, really. And the Lord told me. <laughs> this is what honor means. Honor means to esteem or to greatly value. Okay? So honor does not mean I agree with every decision that you make. Honor does not mean you're doing awesome even if you're not. Honor does not mean lie about the facts and the circumstances in your life. <coughs> Honor means that you esteem someone and you have great value for them. Okay? So this is a, a command that the Lord has that everyone can do. One of the greatest ways that you can honor your parent is to number one, Receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and honor him above all else. That's number one. Yeah. <laughs> number two is to recognize that you were a sinner when Jesus died for you. You were a sinner when Christ died for you. And to recognize that parents are people too. So when I brought this message of honoring your mother and father, and that's not my message tonight, but when I brought this message to the youth, that was my title. Parents are people too. And when we are born into a culture of I want what I want, when I want it, and if I can't get it, I'm going to throw a fit until I can, and a culture of instant gratification and a culture of entitlement, it is difficult to honor <laughs> people who you don't feel have earned it. That is not why you honor your parents. It is not because they've earned it. It is because of the position that they have in your life that was granted to them by God, the creator of life. You would not be here if he did not allow you to be born, if he did not predestine you to be born. And he placed your parents in that position in your life on purpose. Okay? So we have an epidemic. <laughs> In the United States of fatherlessness, of motherlessness, we have an epidemic of children growing up in homes where there's either no father or no mother or no father or mother and they're in um, adoptive care or foster care or orphanages or we have mothers like in the story that I was talking about, right? where there are difficult, tremendously difficult situations for little kids to grow up in. And so the one that I want to focus on tonight is fatherlessness. That there is a result on this earth, in this natural earth, to a father, a natural father, being absent in the life of their children. I'm going to share with you a quote that comes from a book called A Fatherless Generation that I just heard this past weekend. And then I'm going to share some statistics with you of a direct result. And this is not like I'm telling you what the Bible says. I'm telling you facts. These are real, actual statistics of the result of fathers not being in the lives of their children. Y'all okay? All right. I know it's serious. And serious is a little bit hard for me because y'all know me, ladies. Hello, y'all. Okay, um, this guy wrote a book called Fatherlessness, A Fatherless Generation. 
and I'll be 100% honest, I don't remember his name, so this might not be a perfect quote, exact quote from the book, but he said something to the tune of the, there is a result of poor parenting and a lack of fathers in the natural, and it is devastating. The promiscuity of fatherless girls and the violent rage of fatherless boys leaves us in a desperate place. Um, okay, y'all remember that part of the scripture, fathers do not, like, make your children, do not bring your sons to wrath or do not, like, force your children to have wrath, but instead, bring them up. Yeah. Raise them up. Yeah. Like, the way that you get rid of that wrath is by them being raised up, by them being brought up. And so, listen, it's going to get better and lighter in just a few minutes, so y'all bear with me, I promise. Okay, fatherlessness is a factor in, so there is fatherless present in 63% of youth suicides, all suicides under the age of 18, 63% fatherless, 71% of all teen pregnancies, 90% of homeless teenagers and runaway teenagers, 70% of all juveniles in state organizations, this one's really scary, 80% of rapists fatherless, 80%. 71% of high school dropouts are fatherless, 75% of adolescents in a chemical abuse center 85% of all youth sitting in prison. So that is pretty devastating, right? That is pretty um, hard to swallow when we know, when we see the facts, the actual, the actual response to nature when the father is not there. The actual response of children when their dad is not the type of dad that he should be are all of these statistics. So, does anyone in here have a perfect parent? Does anyone in here have just like a perfect upbringing? I would say to you that even the ones who I bet have the closest to a perfect, like what you would look at and be like, wow, those are perfect parents. They don't have perfect parents. You know why? Because parents are people too. So what is the answer, ladies and gentlemen, to this fatherless epidemic? To the fact that not a single person in this room has a natural, perfect father who brought them up. There is no solution in the natural. There is not a single answer. Because there is not one perfect father in this world. There is one answer. There is one solution. And his name is Jesus. Okay, Jesus came to earth as a man, put on humanity. God, God in heaven, comes to earth as a man. He is born of a virgin. Do you understand the picture that God the Father is painting? Your natural parent on earth, your natural father on earth, is not the only way that you can live a perfect, redeemed, holy life. Jesus himself did not even have a natural father who participated in him getting to be born on this earth. Do you ever wonder why in the Bible, rarely do you hear mention after Jesus is born of his earthly father, Joseph? Why do you think that is? I don't think it's because he was a particularly horrible dad. I don't think it was because he was a particularly awesome dad. I think it was because God wants us to see that one thing outweighs the relationship that you can have with your natural father on this earth. And that is the relationship that you have with your father in heaven. Because time after time after time in the scripture... Jesus refers to his father in heaven. Jesus even says to his parents, his natural parents, when they're looking for him, he's 12 years old, y'all, 12 years old. And they couldn't find him. He was in the temple. He said, hello. <laughs> could you not, could you not just imagine to yourself that I'd be in my father's house? There is no doubt in my mind of the importance of the role of a father 
in our lives. The importance, quite clearly, in the natural even, of a father in our lives to affirm us and to commend us and to encourage us and to bring us up and to nurture us. There is no doubt in my mind that it is important in every single life on this earth to have a father in your life. But I am here to tell you that that father, that place in your heart that where you crave affection from a dad, where you crave, well done, baby, you did good. I'm proud of you. Where you crave, you're a good girl. You're a good girl. Where you crave, you did so good, son. I am so proud of you. I'm so glad you're doing what you're doing with your life. Where you crave these affirmations, these words from a father. Jesus himself felt that. You know how I know that? Because the Bible says that he is not a high priest that cannot relate to us. If there is something on earth that we experience, that we feel, that we have need of, he had it too. And he got it. But the Bible does not say, Joseph said to Jesus, you're going to make it on that cross. You're going to do it, son. Joseph never said, boy, You'll show them. You'll show them who's the truth, the light, and the way. The Bible does say that his father in heaven Open the clouds to say, you are my son. I am pleased with you. It is the affirmation and the calling of our father in heaven that we crave and that we desire. Okay? And there is something in this world. There is a law of sin and death that demands payment for poor parenting. There is a law of sin and death that says if your dad leaves your mom and she's a single mom, you won't finish high school. There's a law of sin and death that says if your parents neglect you and abuse you, you'll be a runaway and pregnant and on drugs. There is a law of sin and death that applies to the world. When you are saved and redeemed, when you um, receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you say, that law does not apply to me. Because there is a law that is greater than that. There is a man, there is a man, a man named Jesus who paid the ultimate price so that you don't have to pay for the sins of your parents. You don't have to be hopeless because your parents didn't give you a leg up. That's right. You don't have to pay for the things that they say to you. Those words that cut so deep that our dads can say to us that no one else can say a word that cuts as deep. No one else can say a word that cuts as deep as the one who's supposed to say, good girl, here's a hand. I will help you. Right? No words can cut as deep as those words that are supposed to be one way that turn out another. Yeah. And there is no hope. There is no hope without perfect parents. Yeah. Unless Jesus comes to earth as a man and shows us a better way that we don't have to rely on our parents to be good people. That we don't have to rely on our parents to be who God created us to be. That we have a father in heaven that we can call on, who calls on us. Isn't that great news? Yes. Isn't that great news? Yes. That it's not just about who your mom and daddy is. Right. It's not. <laughs> it wasn't even about that for Jesus, right. the perfect man. It was about his father in heaven whom he called on time and time Again, and so again, I say unto you, parents are people too. And maybe the greatest honor, maybe the greatest way that we can honor our mother and father is to admit that, is to confess that, is to say, you know what, God? My parents did me so wrong, but I've done you wrong. 
And you didn't bat an eye. You took me the second I said yes. Amen. You were waiting on me to come. What if you just look up to the Lord and say, I know <laughs> I didn't have the awesome parents that so-and-so had. <laughs> but parents are people too. Yeah. And so, Father, I forgive them. And, Father, I release them. Perhaps the greatest honor that you can show your parents, the greatest value that you can show them on this earth is to believe in your heart that God is good no matter what. And he's not punishing you by giving you the parents that he gave you. That that doesn't limit you in some way because he's against you, right? That he is rewarding you. That he is rewarding his son for suffering on the cross with your very parents, who are people too, who Jesus came for. He lived for them and died for them and rose again for them. And the very least that you can do is forgive them and release them to him. Instead of blaming them for the way that you turned out, you don't have to blame anyone for anything. I heard this... Um, well, we'll get in there later. Okay. So, without perfect parents, we are all doomed. We are all condemned unless there is a solution. And there is. His name is Jesus. So, we're going to go to Romans 8, and we're just going to stay there the rest of the night. Verse 1 says, okay, this is so good. So, without perfect parents, according to the world, according to the law of sin and death, we are all condemned. But what does the Bible say? Romans 8, verse 1, there is now, therefore, no <coughs> condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When you are in him, it doesn't matter who your parents are. It doesn't matter what they taught you. It doesn't matter if you know right from wrong by your natural parents. You come into relationship with Christ, everything changes. The rules change. There is now no more condemnation. You don't have to abide by that law that says you will be a loser the rest of your life. You don't have to abide by that law that says, oh, really? Your mom and daddy were horrible? You're going to be a bad parent. You don't have to abide by that. There is no condemnation for you. You are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation for you. There is a law that's greater than the law of sin and death, and it is Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, this is verse 2, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. So good. Who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Do you get it? The penalty? The penalty for bad parents. The penalty for bad parenting. Right? Is redeemed by the cross of Jesus. If you are in him... That penalty does not belong to you. He paid that penalty on the cross. Therefore, you cannot blame your parents for a single thing, for a single event in your life. You cannot. You cannot. Because that penalty hung on the cross and his name is Jesus. Do you understand? The payment for that penalty has been taken care of. You cannot blame your parents. You are free from that. If you could blame your parents, then you would still be under that law. And everything that the law says, everything that the rules say, everything, every bad statistic would have to apply to you. But it does not in Christ. You are free from that. Okay? Because he came. 
as a man and defeated that. It's so wonderful. And so let's go to verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Do you understand what the Word is saying? You have a choice. You can decide. I'm not letting them go. I'm going to keep blaming Mama and Daddy because they made me so mad. Then you're going to stay exactly where you are. And you will not be able to change a single thing. That's right. You have a choice. You can set your mind on Jesus, just like the scripture says. It says you can have your mind on the spirit That's right. and desire what the spirit desires. Because what the flesh wants is to agree with the enemy. And you know what he wants? Steal, kill, destroy. That's right. You know what Jesus wants? Oh, come on. He wants you to have a good life. He wants you to have a full life, a life full of joy and hope and power to overcome anything that comes in your way. Ooh, that's right. Come on. So don't get stuck in this rut of, but if my mom and daddy just loved me a little bit more, if I could just have been held a little more as a child, you'll stay in that same place of blame. Because you know what the flesh wants? The flesh demands that there be a price paid for the way that they treated you. Jesus paid right. the price for you to be free. Right. You don't have to have your earthly parents' permission to succeed. You have your Father in heaven's permission to be an amazing child, right. to be his. Okay, so we're going to go on to um, verse 6. It says, The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You know what this is saying? Have you ever said this? If you loved me, you would give me parents who cared about me. If you loved me, you would give me this. If you loved me, God, if you really loved me, you would give me better, better parents. How about if I loved you, I gave you my son. I set you free from having to pant to depend on the perfection of your parents for you to have a good life. How about that kind of love? Okay? I heard this fantastic word yesterday or the day before. I can't remember. But basically, um, this lady said that if you keep blaming others for what you're doing and you keep saying, well, I'm just... This is just a mistake that I made because of the way I was brought up. Or this is just a mistake that I made because of um, I really didn't know any better. Or this is just a mistake. This is just a mistake. This lady said, it is not a mistake. God does not forgive mistakes. And God does not receive it when you try to blame other people for your mistakes. You know what God forgives? Sin. You admit that you have sinned, he is faithful, he is just, and he will forgive you. But you keep blaming other people for the things that you do wrong, what's he going to do with that? Do you know who blames other people for the wrong? Do you know who blames and accuses? Satan, the accuser of the brethren. You are not on his side. You are on the side of the Lord. You are on the side of the Lord. He will forgive you. Just admit that you've sinned. Admit that you've fallen short of the glory of God, yeah. right? Yeah. He is faithful. Yeah. He will forgive you. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I'll say that again. I've said that to some people in here. Yeah. The second that you admit that it is sin, you only have to say it once. You only have to say it one time that you were wrong. You only have to admit one time that you sinned. God will forgive you that 
instant and remove that sin as far away from you as the east is from the west. A distance that we cannot humanly fathom or try to wrap our brain around. That is how good he is. That is how faithful he is. But if you keep blaming other people and you keep making excuses for your mistakes and you don't call it sin, you're going to keep doing it. You're going to keep doing it. And you're going to keep blaming other people. So what does the Bible say? What we just read. You want peace? The mind that has peace? Stop blaming other people for the things that you've done wrong. Stop blaming other people for your sin. Confess your sin. Get forgiveness and move on. Okay? That is the only way that you can get over it. You, however, verse 8, I mean 9, chapter 8, verse 9. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh. You are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed, then, the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, then they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because his spirit lives in you. So do you understand that? To be able to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is your Savior, if you believe that, you believe that the Holy Spirit of God has the power to raise Jesus from the dead. You believe that. Yeah. That is what you confess when you say that Jesus Christ is Lord. Right. That the Holy Spirit in his power raised him from the dead. From the dead. And that same spirit that raised him from the dead lives in you. That means that no matter what the rules say, no matter what the odds are stacked against you for the way that you were raised, there's a greater power that lives in you. Amen. A greater power that says that does not apply to you. Amen. Do y'all know that I know a lady who learned how to read off her dad's prison uniform? Do you know what she's doing now? She's a director of a huge ministry. Mm, amen. Do you know? That I don't know her personally, but everybody's heard of um, Joyce Meyer. Yeah. Has anybody in here not heard of Joyce Meyer? Oh, I thought you were raising your hand. I was like, she's amazing. Do you know that her daddy raped her her whole life? Yeah. Her own father. Do you know what she's doing now? Yeah. Do you know what she even did for him? The man who raped her and abused her her whole life. She built a house for him and nursed him, right? Back to hell. She did what Jesus would do because that law that says you will never amount to anything, that law that says you have to be angry the rest of your life does not apply when the power of Jesus That's invades right. your life. Right. He sets you free from that. That's right. So even Jesus, right? Even Jesus, who came as a man, All right. <laughs> preachers are people too, I'm just kidding, I just wanted to say I'm a preacher, <laughs> so anyway, um, even Jesus, like when Jesus was on earth, you know what people said, they were like, can anything good even come out of Nazareth? <laughs> Do you ever feel like that, like people are just looking for you to fail because of where you came from? Yeah. People are expecting you to fail because of what the natural law of man says should happen to you. You know? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Why, yes, the Savior of the world. Can anything good come from your family? Yes. Because you are in this room. 
you are in here right now hearing this word from the Lord. That you're amazing. That the power of heaven lives in you. And that it doesn't matter. You're not bound. You're not bound to the limitations that the law that says you have to have perfect parents to have a chance has. You are free. Because the power of God is greater than the power of the evil one. Okay? So, we'll go on with verse 12. Still chapter 8 of Romans. So good. The word is alive. The word is alive. And it makes us alive. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. We have an obligation but it is not to the flesh to live according to it for if you live according to the flesh you will die but if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body you will live y'all that is fantastic news and i don't know if you get it but you understand where the bible says just a few chapters earlier that the wages of sin is death So the second that you start trying to make other people pay for their sin, you're never going to get finished. You're never going to get enough. You cannot get enough because the wages of their sin is death. A death that has already been paid. So your obligation is to live in the spirit. Your obligation is to release people from this standard of perfection that you would have to otherwise demand of them to pay for shortcomings in your life. Because Jesus, the perfect man, came and he paid that price for you. He even said it. It is finished. You cannot charge people for the sins that they've committed against you. Jesus paid for them. He already paid for them. Okay, I'm just going to share something with you that Miss Kayla Cooper said. She's right here on the front row looking all beautiful. But anyway, so we had this this conference here called Pure, and um, she taught on a session a session called Hope. And she said, you know, as a young girl, when you think about the one, like talking about marriage, she's like, there's a lot of pressure. To think about the one. Like, you got to find just one? Do you know how many cute boys are out there? I'm kidding. She didn't say that. (laughs) Do you know how many people are out there to know that there's just, if there's just one, you got to find the perfect man? She said, guess what, girls? Relax. The pressure of finding the perfect man is not on you. You have already found him, and his name is Jesus. He is the perfect man. Man, So you do not have the pressure, unmarried ladies, to find the perfect man. He has already been found. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the perfect man. Therefore, (laughs) release your husbands, release your future husbands from demanding perfection from people. People are people. Parents are people too. And so I'm taking Kayla Cooper's quote because it really ministered to me. And applying it to this word right here. You do not have to live under the pressure of your life and your livelihood being dependent on having a perfect human parent. You do not have to live under the pressure of having a perfect mother and father. You have a perfect father, and he is in heaven. You have a perfect father, and he is in heaven, and he loves you. He loves you. Let's take it a step further. Parents. Parents. I say with fear and trembling because I love y'all and honor y'all and would love to be one of (laughs) y'all. You do not have to live under the pressure of having a perfect son. 
You do not have to live under the pressure of having a perfect child. There is a perfect son, and his name is Jesus. The perfect, <laughs> the perfect father, the perfect son has already come. You do not have to live under the pressure of maintaining that perfection. I'm convinced that that's got to be one of the reasons why the Bible doesn't talk about Joseph that much. We really don't know that much about him. Yeah. It talks about the Father, yeah. the Father in heaven, who Jesus was always talking to, who he was always going back to, who he was always talking about, who he was walking in and living in. It's not about coming from the perfect family line. It's not even about building a perfect family. It's about pointing everyone that you can to the perfect Father who is in heaven. Okay, so your obligation, right? We said an obligation. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. We do. We have an obligation, but that obligation is not to be a perfect parent. That obligation is not to be a perfect child, or else there's no more opportunity for you in this life. That is not your obligation. Your obligation is to be led by the Spirit. Your obligation is to be led by the truth that Jesus paid a price, not only for you, but for your parents and for your children. He paid a price. That is our obligation. You know why? Verse 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. For what? Verse 15. For what? For you have not received a spirit of of bondage again to fear. You have not received a spirit of bondage again to fear. I feel like some people struggle accepting God as Father. I personally know someone very close to me who refuses to call God Father because she was sexually abused by her father. And when she hears Father, she cringes. We do not have to be bound by fear that God is going to let us down. We do not have to be bound by the fear that God is going to leave us. We do not have to be bound by the fear or the disappointment that any human has ever laid on us. God is not a man that he should lie. He is a father. He is a good father. And you do not have to be afraid to cry out, Abba, Father. And that is why the scripture goes on to say that you have received a spirit of adoption. A spirit of adoption whereby you cry, Abba, Father. God gets it. That your dad didn't give you everything that he could, even if you had the best dad on planet earth. He cannot, could not ever in this life give you everything that your heavenly father means for you to have. But the good news of the gospel is that you can have it all. You can, you can, and you can by accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior and receiving the spirit of adoption whereby you cry safely, Abba, Father, I want everything that you have for me. I want everything that you have for me. I want to cling to you, and I want to call you Father. I want to know that you will be there no matter what. I want to crawl up into your lap when I've had a bad day. I want to be safe in your arms. I want to be safe. I want to know that when you're for me, when you're with me, no one can come against me. I want to know that you're going to protect me, that you're going to shelter me. I want to know that I'll never go without. I want to know that I will never go without, that not a day will go by where I would have to beg for bread because you are my father and you are providing for me. Not just enough to get by, but to be in abundance. That is
here's what you want to know. Is that not what we all crave? We crave that in this life. We were born to cry, Abba, Father. And God's perfect plan for us is to have a perfect Father. That's why he sent Jesus. So that we can call on him. When you go into an orphanage, the children don't pick the parents. If they did, there wouldn't be any babies in there. If they did, there would not be one childless, I mean one fatherless child on this earth. You don't pick your parents when you're in an orphanage. The parents pick you, right? Same goes for God. Sometimes people tell this story like, you just, you just really need to come up here and choose God, like choose God. You need to, you need to choose that, 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 that you, will, you will follow him. Like God's just up there like desperate for people to just be a, a minion in his little factory where he just needs more, I don't know, little minions. <laughs> He's a father. He's a father. And you don't have to be at wit's end just seeking blindly. He is choosing you. That is why the Bible even says, you did not choose me. I chose you. I chose you. Like, it does not matter what your parents have said or done, and even the best parents on this earth cannot meet the standard that God has for your life for you. He is the only one. He is the only one who can have that position in your life. And he's already chosen you because you're in this room. I'm telling you, I know it. He's so good. And so um, you have two choices. In an orphanage even, even if you're in an orphanage, you can choose to go with the perfect dad who picks you of all people that he could have picked. Or you can reject him. You can say, nope, not going. I know all about dads. You can bring him any story you want, any earthly experience that you want. You can reject him, you can. But you can also go with him. You can choose him. You can fall into this perfect fatherhood. I mean, he's amazing. He's wonderful. He's the best dad you can imagine. Better than the best dad. And so, um, a few nights ago, weeks ago maybe, we had like a little birthday party for one of our friends. It was her birthday, and so we had a surprise birthday party for her, and her parents were here. And so at one point, we did this really cool thing that I recommend everybody does. We had the birthday girl sit in the middle. We were in the youth sanctuary, and we all sat around her, and we were just giving her, like, you know, what we love about her. Everybody was just saying something nice about her, like, you know, we love the way she sings and the way she ministers to people and the way she blesses people. And, and her parents were there, and that was just a gift in and of itself that, her parents love her that much, and so she's sitting in the middle. Her mother and father are sitting, like, over here, and I was sitting over here, like, right across from her dad and her mom, okay? So her mom says, like, all this just, like, amazing, <coughs> cheerful, like, awesome stuff about her, and then her dad, her dad's the last one who gets to say anything. And I'm sitting right across from him, and I'm looking at him in the eyes. Like, I'm, I'm looking at him, and I'm telling you from where I was sitting and from where he was sitting, it could have been like he was speaking to me. And you know what he said to her? He said, you know what? I'm just, I'm not a man of many words, but I'm just really enjoying hearing what everyone says about you. And then he said, so proud of you. And I sat there across from him. Y'all, and I just received it. 
as if it was my dad speaking to me, as if it was my dad saying, I love your reputation. I love that people say good things about you. As if it was my dad saying, I am so proud of you. I just received it. It ministered to my heart. And more than receiving it like it was my earthly father, I knew it was a word from the Lord for me. I knew that he was not just telling his daughter that she was awesome and he didn't even know that this is happening. This is how perfect our father in heaven is. Other people don't even have to know what his plan is. <laughs> he can use people who don't have a clue <laughs> to speak a word in our hearts. That was God the Father, man. He was saying, I love the way people talk about you. I love the good things they say about you. I love, I love everything that you're doing and I'm proud of you. And so... When, when After I just, like, received that word, like, the Lord was just stirring in me that, that there are words, fatherly words of affirmation that some girls never get from their own dad. There are fatherly words that the Bible is packed with that have such a great impact. When we hear the voice of a man saying that he is proud of us. And so we have a little clip that we may do in three minutes. So I got to thinking about that. <laughs> and I don't have the voice of a man. I mean, sometimes when I sing, I do. <laughs> sometimes it comes out like that. And so um, I had Andrew help me, and we made a video just of some fathers speaking words of affirmation to their children. And so what I want us to do is to open our hearts and open our ears to hear the voice, to hear the voices of fathers, like earthly fathers, good, godly men, <laughs> speaking to their children. And more than that, I want everybody right now to take a moment and just release your parents from that law of sin and death. Release your parents from the perfection that they'll never attain. Parents are people. They're people too. But your Father in Heaven is perfect. And He loves you perfectly with an everlasting love. And so one way, one way to ensure that you don't receive what God has to say to you is to hang on to what you don't like about this subject. So whatever you don't like about your parents, whatever you feel like you got the short end of the stick, I'm here to tell you the people in here with the best parents on earth got the short end of the stick if they're settling for their parents on earth and not for their father in heaven. And I believe that every good father in here would agree with me, right? You are settling if you do not want to receive the perfect love of a perfect father in heaven that he has for you. So, yeah. daughters that uh, never forget they'll always be my baby. And that, uh, godliness in a woman is what all godly men lives for. That, uh, their inner beauty is the most important thing that they could ever have. And as long as they had that, that would be great. And 
love you, son. I love you, daughter. I love you, son. <laughs> <laughs> I would just like to say that I'm, I'm proud of all three of my children. Uh, that Adam has become quite a good young man and a, a good father. And uh, I, I'm proud of where he's come. I'm extremely proud of, of Dylan and the changes that he's he's making in his life and the effort that he's putting out and to get everything right. And I'm extremely proud of Allie, of the young lady that she's becoming. Good to hear. Uh, I love you, son, and good job. My desire to hear from my dad has just always been to make him proud of the man that I am. I love you, son, because I would like to hear the words that Jesus Christ is my Savior. So, do you see even receiving from another father? is powerful, right? Am I the only one who was like, oh, I receive, I receive, I receive it. You're proud of me. Thank you. Um, and how about that? How about that, that, that the one way that you could honor your parents the most is to hold on to the hand of God, is to put him first. I heard someone say, Yesterday or the day before, I can't remember, that the greatest honor you can show anyone is to take them God, to take them the Lord, the truth, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. <laughs> All right, so um, let's pray. Is that good? Father, we... We love you, Father. You're a you're a good dad. You're such a good dad. God, I just ask in Jesus' name that you would grace every one of us to release our parents, to release our children, to release other people from the demand of the law of sin and death that says that, that they have to be perfect in order for us to survive. Thank you, King Jesus, that you are perfect, that you are perfect. Thank you, Lord, that the power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. God, make us aware, make us aware daily that you are with us, that you are for us, that you are a good father. And God, I just ask a special a special blessing and a special grace on anyone who is struggling with letting their parents go, with forgiving, um, forgiving their parents, forgiving anyone who sinned against them in their lives. God, I just ask that you release a special grace for us to let go of the wrong that others have committed to us. God, as freely and as completely as you have let go of the many, many sins that we've committed against you. Father, we love you, and I just ask that you pour your love into every heart that's in this room, God, that you pour your healing love into every heart, and that you let every one of us become rooted and grounded in that love. And Father, I ask that you baptize us with the spirit of adoption, that you baptize us with the spirit that trusts you, that you baptize us with the spirit that cries at our lowest and at our highest, Lord, that you are Abba, that you are Father, that you are good. We love you, God, and we bless you. Thank you, God, for making a way. Thank you, God, for making a way that our livelihood 
is not dependent on the perfection of other people. Our livelihood is not dependent on the performance of those around us or even of the performance that we muster up in and of ourselves, that our livelihood is dependent on Jesus, that our livelihood is dependent on a sure plan, on a sure um, a sure <coughs> Savior. We love you, God, and we give you our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I do want to just open, I mean, open the altar. Like, if anybody wants um, prayer for any reason whatsoever, if you feel like you want a man of God to pray over you, if your dad's never prayed for you, I know that there are men of God in this room who would pray with you, who would release a blessing, like a fatherly blessing over your life. And if you if you would like to just come and kneel before your Father in heaven and have him love on you, then by all means you can do that. Um, if you've never received this word, I don't mean heard it, I mean received it. That, that you do not have to live as an orphan, that you do not have to be punished for the rest of your life because of the mistakes that those around you have made, and you want desperately to be free from that, then we would love to pray with you, too, for, for salvation, to receive Jesus as your Savior. So I'm just going to worship, but if anybody wants prayer, please come. Thank you. 